today, Mr. Paul Humphreys, is a man who undoubtedly knows the price of milk because he's going to tell us how to look after our money affairs from lifetime planning to how to write your will. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a hearty welcome to Mr. Paul Humphreys. Well, good morning and a very warm welcome to this seminar run by Asset Wealth Preservation. Um, thanks for you so much for agreeing to give up your time to hear me speak. Um, I'll try and make it as interesting and as informative as I can for you. I've been doing this talk for about the last uh, 10 years now. Um, this particular subject, Keep It In The Family, I've been concentrating on uh, really because I've heard the same refrain whenever I go. How is it that I could spend so much of our lifetime building up an excellent asset base, perhaps actually getting a house, paying off a mortgage and pensions, and such things like that, yet risk losing such a high percentage of that money in the last few years of our lives. So what I want to do today is explore some estate planning and some lifetime planning options with you during the course of the next hour. I always draw a distinction between estate planning and life planning. To me, estate planning is really about death and wills and things like that, very important. However, in this day and age, we need to look at life planning. We need to protect our assets during our lifetime so there's something of value that we can actually, when the time comes of our death, um, so something that our family can look forward to. I'll have a full questions and answers question at the end. So if you don't mind, um, what I do, I prefer not to, uh, for you not to ask any, 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 any questions during the uh, um, presentation as it, it seems to interrupt the flow. Um, and I also find that some of the questions are actually answered later. Just let me tell you a bit about me. For those who don't know, my name's Paul Humphreys. For those who know me, my name's Paul Humphreys. I'm an estate planner, not to be confused with an estate agent. Um, an estate planner, in, in essence, ensures that your hard earned is maintained by your family and it's not lost to predators and creditors, as we shall see. Now, I've run my own estate planning practice for about the last 20 years and I'm also regional chairman of the Society of Will Writers and Estate Planners. Um, behind me, I, I have partnered uh, chartered accountants, slitters, barristers, vetted by the Society of Will Writers, the top experts in this field, uh, which enables me to give clients the best advice and they also know that they're in safe hands. So today I'm going to talk in very broad principles. We have a number of people here, you're all from different family situations and backgrounds and you probably have different types of goals that you want to achieve. Uh, so I'm speaking in very general principles. In reciprocation for your kindness and listening to me to speak for a while, uh, I'll offer to come and sit with you so you can do the talking, you can tell us what you found of interest and how you can perhaps delve deeper into the principles and apply them to your situation, uh, and more about this later. Other than yourselves, the most important people too in the room are John and Mary. Yes, I may be an estate planner, but I hate long words and I feel illustrations can work much better and I hope you're okay with that. Uh -huh. I've, ch I've chosen John and Mary as a starting point. Then an elderly married retired couple. Great way to start looking at cross-generational transfer of assets. We could have chosen a young single person. We could have chosen a, a middle-aged cohabitee. Uh -huh. But we're going to look at this situation and that, this will get us underway. John and Mary, they have a child. His name is Peter, and his wife is Sandra. And John and Mary, they have three grandchildren. Now, don't worry too much about the details. I'm not going to test you about them later. The important thing is that you put your own family there into the picture. Now, let's start with some very basic estate planning. You probably know this, and you probably got it, and, and you know this stuff, and that's great, but it will serve as a platform for things we want to explore a bit later on. Well, why make a will? As you know, probably you know, two thirds of the population in the UK never got around to making a will. The trouble is, if you don't make a will, you're what is termed as intestate. You've made no testament in place, and if you don't want to make one, basically the state makes one for you. How do they do that? Well, they look back, basically, right back till uh, 1925, when the regulations were put in place. And they make a will 
base view on those old regulations. The trouble is, in the UK in 2016, it's a very different place than the UK in 1925 when these regulations were put in place. So some of the results of using these old regulations could sometimes see particle. Now John and Mary, I told them about that and they said they really should get around to making a will. So if you do make a will, uh, you do need to nominate some people who execute your wishes according to the terms of your will. Um, after we name a son, a daughter, sometimes a spouse or an executor, some people use a bank or solicitor for this, nothing wrong with that, but do check very closely what's the charging rate is what will be applied for doing the probate work. It can turn out to be a very awful lot of money. The other thing we need to know is a will is who's going to benefit under the terms of the will. You can specify a uh, vesting age, all that means in English law is that unless you say otherwise, an infant who's going to benefit under the terms of your will will receive the money at age 18. So we recommend uh, to, to people to consider a more mature age of 18 to 23. You can also give your funeral directions, a very important thing to do, and so a will is a good thing to have, uh, but you should wisely for those sort of things on that. So mirror wills, um, an expression you've probably heard of, I see a lot of couples and they say to me, well, I want to leave my estate to my spouse and then to my children. The other spouse would look at me and say, my wishes reflect those, pure and simple, that is a mirror will. In the case of John and Mary, I sat them down and had a long chat with them. They didn't actually sound like so many of my clients. They say, well, I want to, we want to leave our state uh, to each other. And then when we're gone, we want to go to our son, Peter. And when he dies, we like to go down to the grandchildren. And they would love to think that their assets passes on through the generations, through the bloodline. So let's work an example of this on this occasion. Let's say John dies first. His will said everything to his wife, Mary. So he said everything to his wife, Mary. No problems there. Now, so everything to his wife, Mary. Sorry about this, <laughs> technical. And when they're gone, they wanted to leave it to their son, Peter. When he died, they were likely to go down the generation of that. Now, when Mary dies in the world, she wants everything to go to her husband, John. But if he's already died, the wills have done their job in this very simple, simple situation. <coughs> now, the trouble is that we're no longer living in a simple country. Everything is very complex in the UK these days. You've probably noticed our family units are changing. It seems to be changing beyond recognition. And we now feel that making a will is simply not enough by itself. It's not now just not, it's just like having a wish list. Now, a will is a good thing, and please nobody here leave today saying that Paul said making a will is not necessary. Of course it's necessary. It's a good thing to do. It's just no longer does the jobs that we want it to do. Let's just have a look at some examples why making a will is, uh, is not enough on that. So remarriage after death. On this occasion, um, we will actually lose John first. Mary gets the estate. She's missing John very, bra very badly, and he doesn't know really what to do. A couple of years go by, and she wakes up one morning and says, I really have to open my eyes to the possibility of a new relationship. And before very long, the new man appears at the scene. <laughs> they decide to get married, which is fabulous news. The downside is the moment that they, these two get married, Mary's existing will is revoked. Why? Because that's what English law declares will happen. So Mary, bless her, is totally unaware of this fact. She is now intestate. And if she was to die, then who gets the claim on the estate? It's the new man. Peter has no claim to, to compete with this new man, who has now got all of John and Mary's assets on that. A will is not enough. Why not? Okay. So another example of, making, of why, a will, why making a will is not enough, that subject of divorce. So here we are again, John and Mary. John dies first again, bless him. 
Mary's got the estate. Mary dies, Peter gets the estate. So far, so good. The trouble is, in the last few years of their life, John and Mary simply didn't hear the nasty little arguments that were going on between Peter and Sandra. They didn't see the crockery flying backwards and forwards <laughs> across the kitchen table. This marriage was in meltdown. But Sandra had left it until Peter had safely inherited his parents' stuff. And then San Sandra said, Peter, sit down, we need to talk. And off she disappeared with half of John and Mary's assets. Now, this is not the right device to deal with this situation. Um, it doesn't protect against this happening. We need to look for a different legal instrument. Why will is not enough? Why making this will is not enough? Premature death. We've got the whole family on display this time. John dies first again. The state goes to Mary. Mary dies. The state goes to Peter. That's okay. But what happens if Peter dies as a, as a relatively young man? Well, in this situation, Sandra would take over. And these are her children, so things are looking okay. But I sense that you're all a little bit anxious because this is what happens next. The handsome new man comes to the scene and Sandra has found love again. And fabulous, and these two get married. But what would happen now if Sandra died first? Well, look, it's just disappeared from the scene. Why? The children, why? Because if these two get married, yeah, the 1925 rule will kick in, and suddenly the new man will have all the new assets. He may die in intestate. He may not want to leave his assets to Sandra's children. Was that how it was intended to be? I don't think so. John and Mary wanted their assets to <coughs> to the bloodline. There's no one from John and Mary's bloodline on that slide. So we need to look at an alternative way of leaving assets to family members to avoid what we call <coughs> sideways disinheritance. Why will is not enough. Care fees, why making a will is not enough when trying to plan for care fees? Now, John <coughs> dies first, everything goes to Mary. But notice, please, the estate is not protected. The house and savings are all open, available, available to be taken by the government or anybody else, uh, and that makes me very, very nervous. Uh, anyway, Mary copes um, without John for a little while, and then her health starts to go downhill. It's, it's, it's decided she has to go into care. She goes into care, her income will be taken, her savings will be taken, despite the uh, hundreds of thousands of pounds of tax John and Mary have paid actually during their life. Mary's house is, of course, empty. So when the savings are used, so when the savings are used, then the house is taken into consideration on that. On that. This is the first main message of the evening, really. A will only takes place when you die. I know that uh, that goes against everything. Uh, you've been told or, or whatever, which is good advice, but doesn't do anything until after you've died. Uh, but you need protection during your lifetime. A will doesn't protect your assets. Why not? It was never designed to do that. Thankfully, there's a, there's a legal instrument which has been around for about 900 years, which the rich have been using, and we all need to do is follow what the rich have done for centuries. So we're going to look at how John and Mary can protect their assets with a trust. So there's something meaningful to pass on to the next generation of the family. Um, now, I might, I thought you might like to spend about just 10 minutes talking about inheritance tax this evening. Um, lots of big numbers here. Titivology tax. Lord John Jenkins made this statement in 1984. <coughs> it is much true today uh, and it was then. I don't know if you could get away with making a statement like that nowadays. <laughs> Now, there is a misconception among people that you have to be rich or well here to pay inheritance tax. 
but the people who actually pay it are the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. Uh, and I'll show you this in a moment. Now, the rich, they don't pay inheritance tax. Why? Because they've familiarised themselves with it over the centuries, and they know how to avoid it. Well, when inheritance tax was uh, first evolved, it was supposed to be a, a tax, really, for the super rich, but not now. Um, I think to start with, the, the first reason we get upset about inheritance tax uh, is the, the first problem, the threshold starts at 325000 Now, house prices are going up, everything's going up. The figure is stuck at this to at least 2020, um, and the promise of putting up, you know, out by the Conservatives uh, to a million never happened. There is something in place, which I'll talk about in a minute. The other scary thing is that 40% is the tax rate to pay, you know, that's double the rate of VAT. Now, a married, married couple, you can actually get a threshold of double the person's um, threshold if your bookkeeping is correct and available. However, cohabitees, you're not allowed to share the allowance, I'm afraid, in the same way as a married couple. Now and again, I, I do come across the situation where the cohabitee dies and the survivor could not pay the inheritance tax. <coughs> So let's look at a uh, first generational inheritance tax. John and Mary, they built up some assets in their lifetime. They purchased a few buy-to-let properties on the way through their hard work. The properties they bought have increased in value over time, and now they have assets of 450k each. John passes away and leaves his 450 directly to Mary. Again, there is no tax to pay at this stage due to the fact that everything left to each other is eligible for interspouse exemption. However, Mary passes away. Let's see what happens. The estate goes to Peter, which compromises of John and Mary's assets, equal to 900k. Now, John and Mary had excellent record keeping in their lifetime, and the HMRC has said that they are eligible for the doubling up of their allowance to 650. John and Mary's allowance of 325 each, this can now be subtracted from the uh, taxable estate of 250,000, which leaves 250,000 taxable estate. The tax is 40% of this, it's given a, a tax bill of 100,000. So, you know I was talking a minute ago about the average person who can pay inheritance tax? Well, let me show you how. A quick example of John and Mary on what I've been talking about. We're giving them a relatively small estate this time. Uh, we're giving John 200,000 and Mary 200,000. John dies first. He has left everything to Mary again. We have not used John's 325 allowance as we, as we have an exemption between spouses, anyhow. Mary <coughs> passes away. with 400,000, but we can use John's 325,000 on that. Now, there's no inheritance tax problems at this moment on that, but what we're ignoring is that at our peril, what John Major used to call um, the Cascade of Elf, what he's talking about is when two or three small estates come together to, to one, one person who then inconveniently dies. Um, Bear in mind that Peter has received 400k from his parents, but he is a grown man, he has assets of his own. We need to put them in the, the picture before we decide whether there is an inheritance tax problem or not. Peter, we have given him, given him uh, a house and some savings, and his estate valuation is 325,000. So in fact, Peter is worth 725,000. This is the cascade of wealth. If Peter was to die tomorrow, there's a tax bill of 160,000. Um, I'll show you with a trust how you can bring that figure down to you know, a, a nice round zero in a minute. So the, by this stage you're probably saying, well, why don't we just give it away to our trusted children? You know, we don't need to pay probate fees, care fees, inheritance tax, etc. But beware, this can be very dangerous, as we'll see later. I'm not saying don't give it away, but take advice. Like most things in life, there's a good way to do it, and there's a very, very dangerous way to do it. Unfortunately, John and Mary didn't take any advice, and they gave everything to their sons, which is extremely dangerous. There's a better way of achieving this. So first of all, what we have, in fact, 
John and Mary done? What have they done? They've lost control of their assets. If you give someone to somebody as a gift, you've lost control of it, haven't you? That's why we make gifts. It's, not up to the reci- it's now up to the recipient to do what they like with it. You can't demand that they use it on their behalf. Now, John and Mary, they gave their house to Peter. Um, they've lost control of those assets, not just to Peter, but remember, Sandra is behind the scenes. And she loves having John and, Mar- and Mary's assets available to her whilst they're alive. And that will influence Peter, and that brings me to, to divorce. Although these assets are in Peter's name, Sandra uses the opportunity to say, I'm sorry, Peter, but this is not working out. And off she goes to the divorce lawyer um, with half of John's and Mary's assets. And John and Mary had to sell their house. Why? Illness. Well, perhaps Peter gets into financial problems or even a business problem. Can you imagine if the creditors come to the door and they say, I'm sorry, sir, but we've come to take your stuff away. And Peter says, you can't touch that because, because it belongs to my mum and dad. They just laugh in your face as they load the truck. Capital gains tax. Remember, Peter already owns his house. This is classed as an investment property and this house is needed to be sold. The capital gains flag is flying and the first check from the net proceeds of the house will be to the capital gains tax office. The local authority, if John and Mary gave all their assets directly to Peter and they have to go into care, the local authority are going to ask some very, very difficult questions. You mean, you gave everything to your son, why would you want to do that? So in hidden evidence tax, there could be issues, meaning unnecessary problems. Uh, so if you're thinking of giving it away, sure, by all means, think in terms of giving it away. Please speak to me first. I can make sure you give it away in a protective environment to make sure the gift you give actually stays within your family and can't disappear in this way. We'll do it with, with a, within a trust. So you're, up, you're probably sick of t- being told you're a, we're, well, we're an ageing population. Um, the Queen obviously sent out uh, telegrams when, when, when you reach 100, which is fabulous. But the number of people over the age of 100 in the UK is, anybody got an idea? This is where I have a bit of audience participation. <laughs> I mean, a bit more than that. So, what would you say though about uh, 2066? How many then? <coughs> Anybody got any like, quick, like, quickly? <coughs> There we go. This is going to be <coughs> 507,000. Why am I interested in this? Uh, the reason is the company is trying to work out future dates, uh, exactly how many mouths they'd have to feed and, and look after. And that's why I'm interested in that. Well, we, we, you know, we, we would think this is cause for celebration. Um, but none of us are jumping up and down on our seats saying that's fabulous news, Paul, and, and thank you for sharing that with us. But, um, because you're all ahead of me, uh, what about the quality of life in the later years? So, on, well, on average, um, we may enjoy good health until age 63. So, have any gentlemen here age 62, please enjoy it while you can. Uh, it's followed by 14% years, what we call a limited illness. So, that's going to slow us down a little bit. Uh, doesn't mean that we're going into care, but life is not going to be just quite as much fun as it used to be. For ladies, we're going to enjoy good health until we're age 65. And that's followed by 16.9 years with a limited illness. Again, that's just something that's going to slow you down a bit. We need really there to be aware of the possibility, possibility that we might have a brush with the care system, uh, whatever our kids tell us. Now, it might not happen, and that's great, but we need to meet this head on so we can make provision in the case we get involved in the care system. In 2009, uh, that was the cost of care. I mean, speaking to people in the area, um, it's something like between 800 and 1,200 pounds per week now on that. One can only think that these figures will go up, you know, as they develop develop more pills and potions and keep us going. Um, Just be aware of those things. As I said, Andy Burnham, he was the the health secretary of the Labour government. 
uh, made this statement some years ago, that figure's not changed. Um, that's the type of figures that uh, one in three men and half of all women will need some form of long-term care and support in the latter years. So care fees, 100% tax. I've been a bit provocative with that slide title, but in fact it's not far from the truth. Um, if we go back to inheritance tax, you pay 40% over 325. Now how dreadful was that? Well, with care fees, if you have assets over 23,250, you will pay for your care completely. Whatever taxes you paid in your lifetime on national insurance, you will pay for your care out of your income and your savings and your capital, etc. And once your assets have been dragged down below 23,250, but still above the lowest threshold of 14,250, you will still have to make con uh, substantial contribution to care. Income, as always, plus capital. Once your assets have been dragged down below 14,250, there's good news. The government can't take any more capital from you. <laughs> That's as low as they can go. The bad news is that uh, your income until the day you die is vulnerable. The vast majority will be taken from you, but the government has put in place protection for its people. You'll be left with about £23.90 per week personal expenses allowance. Don't spend it all at once. Property disregard for dependent relatives. This is a rule, which is a good rule, and we all need to be aware of it, but we must, mustn't come complacent about it. This means if you go into care, you leave your spouse or your relative over the age of 60 or a dependent relative who is already in your house, the local authority has to disregard the property in the financial assessment, which is excellent news, but be careful, this can lead to many crises, which I have seen many times. Just a quick mention about some reform, which was supposed to come into play in 2016, but there's been general elections, this happened a few times now, and it's been put on the back burner until 2020, at the very least, they would consider looking at it again. The proposal, which has not happened, was to increase the upper threshold to 120,000, which is welcomed very warmly. But what they did not, and, um, and what one did not release at first, was the lower limit, as this was the important one. And this was our dear old friends with a bit of inflation um, linked to it. There's going to be a cap on care fees, we were told. Uh, there's not going to be a cap on care fees. There's going to be a cap on the care fee element, and that is it. We're still going to pay for bed, breakfast, meals, hotel costs, as they call them, all those sorts of things. They do not come, come within the cap. The cap is one specific area, so we're still going to have to pay room costs, pharmacy, etc. above that money. Also, um, we no longer need um, to be forced to sell a home to pay for care fees during a resident's lifetime. They will charge the weekly cost plus interest to the house and recover the accruing amount of debt. Married couples, though, you can still lose, even if this is coming into operation, in excess of 225,000 in this area and risk your house being sold like those other one million houses which have been sold to pay for care fees in the last five years. Well, let's just have a look at the full effect of care fees on John and Mary. Well, John is the first one to struggle. His health hasn't been too good for a while. Mary has been finding it increasingly hard to cope, and they decide John has to go into care. John goes into care. What will happen? Well, his assets, savings, are up for grabs. The house is safe because Mary is living there, and Mary's savings are safe, but John's savings will deplete very quickly. We have just seen the level of care fees that we have could be paying. So this is not a pretty picture by all means, but it's not yet catastrophic. But what we often see is that um, when one of the elderly couples, couples goes into care, it is often not very long after that the other follows. It doesn't always happen like that, but it often does. Let's say for the sake of the illustration that Mary follows and goes into care. Things will happen very quickly. First of all, the house will be sold. Mary is no longer living in the house. She is in care. That The house is sold. They use the net proceeds to pay for John's care as well. They have already used up his savings. 
Then, they, and then we used Mary's half share of the house until a proud couple, who t about 25 minutes ago had 400,000, had been brought down to 14,250. Remember John made a will, and that gave all of his estate to his Mary, and the local authority says, aha, and what happens is, they do a fresh financial assessment, and that money disappears as well. So just a quick summary of where we are, if life goes wrong, here's a timeline. Hopefully, everybody today is in this position. position. We've assets that are intact, we've got mental capacity, we're in a good position to do some planning, if we want to do that. As life goes on though, it can throw up a lot of challenges. It doesn't happen to everybody, but a large number of people have these challenges. Um, as life goes on, even though we're still alive, our asset bases can be horribly reduced and diminished. Sure, the will kicks in when we die, but again, it's too late. The damage has already been done. What we need to do is simply copy what the rich and wealthy have been doing for the last eight or nine hundred years. Put a trust in place now, which means it protects our assets in our lifetime, but also controls the way it is left to our next generations, to our family. So you're all looking very depressed now, and uh, <laughs> some suggested that I bring the Samaritan. <laughs> but I'm naturally a happy and buoyant person, so let's look at what we can do to stop all this nonsense. So what I'm going to do now is to look at it in a positive way. We'll look at it, some things you might need, power of attorney, trusts, we'll look at ways you can own your home so we can protect all your assets, to make sure the things that you see in the first half can happen to you and your family. Now I want to talk briefly about lasting powers of attorney, then I'll get onto some protection planning. Um, first of all, anybody here got an old and June power of attorney? Yes, you're ahead, you're ahead of me on that. Um, first thing we recommend is you look after yourselves during your lifetime. Uh, what I've tried to do over the years is help people keep control of what they do as, for as long as they can. It's not easy at different stages of our life, we can have different levels of control. So, but there is a legal instrument called the lasting powers of attorney which enables you to keep control if you lose mental capacity or if you become unwell, which enables you to keep control with the people you love and trust. You probably ask me, well, Paul, my spouse or, or my family, you know, they'll automatically deal with my affairs. And I know you're all thinking, well, why shouldn't they? But well, I'm afraid to disappoint you, the law has got a different spin on this uh, since 2007. You need to have a lasting powers of, of attorney already in place. Such vital documents, um, it's not just an age thing, because if you lose mental capacity, and statistically it's something like one in three people do in their lifetime, unless you've already made lasting powers of attorney, your, your family have to make an application to the court of protection. Why? English law says that if you lose mental capacity, you have no right to make decisions whatsoever. Um, and that includes signing a cheque and running bank accounts, things like that. Your assets are frozen when you lose mental capacity until someone is appointed to look after your affairs for you. If you don't make if you don't make an LPA, then your family will have to apply for what's called a deputyship uh, from the Court of Protection. It costs about five thousand pounds to make an application to the court. It could take forever, um, and, and it has to be reviewed every year, which is a costly exercise. Um, from personal experience, don't leave it, do a lasting power of attorney. Uh, what about joint or assets or joint bank accounts, just the same? Your joint assets are still frozen when you lose mental capacity until someone is appointed to look after your affairs for you. Why is that? Because the law from 2007 says that. Uh, and this is the practice by the British Bankers Association, which involves all banks and, and building societies. A leaflet is readily available in most banks or on their website. So with an LPA, you decide if it comes to your ears, your eyes or your mouth, or if you become ill or incapax, which is normally your loved ones, not third parties. So uh, there's two types of lasting power of attorney, the financial affairs and the health and welfare. The health and welfare is equally as important as the financial affairs. And here's some of the decisions which your dearest will be able to control if you uh, have this second lasting power of attorney. As you can see, this document is equally as important as the first one. So lasting powers of attorney do take them seriously. Careful, though, the, there are people out there, some locally, who will offer you to prayer these documents, but they will charge you 
um, a thousand pounds plus per document, which is, you know, it's frankly absurd for the amount of work which is involved. So just be aware of these people. I can show you in a minute how you can get these free. So now let's do some protection work. Um, let's get back to John and Mary. The first thing people say to me is that I need to protect the house. A house is such an important asset to us, and that's why I get upset when I hear about people's housing, houses having to be sold for pay for care fees. Um, so let's talk about protecting John and Mary's house. What we need to do is first find out how John and Mary own their house. They can own it two ways, and you've probably heard of these expressions as joint tenants or as tenants in common. Now, John and Mary bought their house in the 80s, very much the way people did then, bought it as joint tenants. That means if John and Mary both own 100% of the value of the property, if one of them were to die, automatically that person's name is struck off the register and the survivor would own the rest of the house. Job done. The trouble is the word automatically. We want you, know, you in control of how things happen when protecting your assets. The word automatically doesn't allow us to do that. So what's, what we say to clients is change the way you own your property to what's called tenants in common. So now John and Mary, they own the house 50% of the value of the home. So they can use it as they did before. There's no change there at all. The great thing now is that John and Mary can decide where their half goes after they die. Whoever they want to give it to, even each other. But the great thing is now we can start protecting John and Mary's assets in the lifetime and after their death. So we do this by using the Wealth, Wealth Preservation Trust. This is one of the many trusts we have in our tool bag. Uh, and for today I'm going to just show you this little gem. Uh, this is a very old style trust. It's about 900 years old. Tried and tested universally across the world over the centuries. This offers this offer savings and protections for 125 years. Well, all I do is create a trust each for John and Mary. How do you do that? Well, we prepare a legal document, just like a will. A trust is a legal document, so I prepare a trust for John and Mary. I ask them who they want the trustees to be, just like the executors of a will. Trustees look after the trust. I ask them who, um, who will be your beneficiaries, and they say it's going to be each other, then son Peter, and then the grandchildren, and uh, then the bloodline. What about John and Mary standing in the trust? We'll call them the boss. It's their own trusts. It's a life interest trust to start with, which means they have complete control. They have use and enjoyment of all the assets within the trust. John and Mary, they can actually close down the trust. They've got so much power. They can sack the trustees and appoint new trustees at any time. They can put assets into the trust and take assets out of the trust. They have complete control. They're also what's called the primary beneficiaries. The only thing we need to do now is to find out what John and Mary want to protect. They told me that they want their house and their savings put into trust. We put them into the trust, sign the trust deed, and from that moment, the protection is in place. It is immediate. There's no waiting period. They don't have to wait up for six months until, or until they die. It's immediate. We have ring fence to protect the assets. Because these trusts do not have to go through probate fees or incur executory fees, uh, they just save themselves <coughs> instantly 2-3% to of the value of their assets by not going through probate. The other great thing is, of course, that either John and Mary get the assets immediately, and so does Peter, on both their deaths. And this can continue for the remainder of the 125 years. So let's just concentrate on Peter at the moment. What has actually happened received? Well, he's received 400 k in a controlled environment, and he's decided to pay his mortgage off, which was 400000 The size of the equity is still in the trust fund, so it's still protected. What about Sandra? Do you remember her? At the time when Peter was coming into money, well, Sandra said... This marriage is not working. I'm, I'm, I'm employing a nasty divorce lawyer in Shrewsbury. Not so fast this time, because the asset has passed down through the trust, and the assets was intended slowly, solely for Peter from his parents. Such a different story. Use the trust to transfer assets down to our loved ones. It's a fabulous way. So what about John and Mary, when Peter <laughs> receives the assets from then on? There's no inheritance tax for future generations. The money comes down to Peter, and he can use it how he wants, 
When he dies, he drops to the grandchildren, inherits tax free, and so forth through the generations. So now we've transferred 725k, not a penny of inheritance tax payable. The other side of the benefit of the trust is carefully planning. This time, John and Mary have the trust in place. Let's see what difference it makes. John and Mary took my advice and done the trust each. John goes into care first, and they are under a duty to tell the local authorities that it is, it is in place. Uh, that's the end of it. As long as the trust is set up at the right time in the right circumstances, the assets have to be disregarded by the local authority when they do their financial assessment. Any money outside the, the trust is up for grabs in the usual way. But assets within the trust are safe. If John dies, Mary becomes the primary beneficiary and not the local authority. Because interestingly enough, John didn't mention that. So Mary is now the primary beneficiary of both trusts. Mary goes into care and the same applies. Mary's assets have to be disregarded. Mary eventually passes away and the assets move the very next day to their son Peter. But boy, what a difference this trust has made to this family. Even though both have been in care, their assets are intact for the family to use and enjoy. A much different income just because John and Mary put a place, put a trust in place. So let's look at the situation for a single person. Let's say John is a figment of my imagination. Mary comes to me and says, Paul, I'm just too tired of having my assets uh, up for grabs. Please protect them. Do some protection work. So we, we create ring fence and protect the assets Mary wants to put into trust. Mary uh, wants to place into the trust the house and the savings. But notice there is a trust limit of 325,000. Why do we? Why is that? Well, if you put more than a, um, that in a seven-year period, you will pay inheritance tax of 20%. That's the last thing we want to, you to do. In another seven years, though, we can put another 325 in and so on and so on. The earlier you start, the better to get the assets above 325 for a single person protected. So these, you know, trusts have extreme flexibility and can be drafted as liberal or stringent, stringent as you wish. And this trust has a massive flexibility in a way only wills could dream of. Um, so let's just have a look what this trust will do for us. Primary benefit of trust, as we see, is protection from executive fees. Everyone in the room is going to die. We have an estate of 5,000 or more. Our family have to go through this. Pro rate is where you prove to a judge who's to get what. He checks to make sure everything is right. He checks to make sure the will is a bad will. It can take a long time. It can be very expensive. Lawyers on average charge around £250 plus an hour plus a percentage of your estate. Banks work on a percentage of the estate. It can be up to 8%. And, you know, don't take my word for that, have a look at some of the independent surveys which have been undertaken by The Guardian and The Telegraph and other papers over the years. It may, it may be an eye-opener. So, 3% of your children's estate could be spent on executive fees, and that could be twice if you're a couple. Your assets could also get stuck in probate, and they can be there for months and months and months and it, um, before anybody gets it. So, what people do is set up the trust. In, in, in essence, what they do is pay for the executive, executive fees today at a reduced up rate of up to 80% the cost of setting up the trust. For a couple, that's a profound saving. Money which could be going to your loved ones. Um, you know, you've got to pay the prices sometimes, so financially it makes total sense to pay today's rates on that. Um, but you've also got other benefits included for free, which I'll talk about in a minute. So trusts are also very private. You know, and these can't be looked up online, uh, like wills, which can be. So, you know, criminals can be, and loads of people can find out. So, what we do is just a look at the, some of the additional free benefits that you get when you set up a wealth preservation trust. Um, we also, we, you know, I just mentioned the immense initial savings which the trust gives you, um, which pays for itself many, many, many times over. Things that are, are really important about a trust. Let's just look at a few of these. Um, as we said, put no probate fees and delays. Uh, loss on remarriage. We talked about sideways dis disinheritance and third parties getting it. Divorce. Divorce of our children. Um, Loss of bankruptcy. If you're in business, and a lot of people go into business nowadays, or they're self-employed, something like a third of the UK are self-employed now, working. Um, 
then so the money within the trust it cannot be used. Um, the, the creditors can't come for it. Or you know, and some families, you know, as well, you know, finance, um, you get into financial difficulties at some stage in your life, and it's protected against that. Losses for state support for disabled uh, uh, beneficiaries. If you leave it directly, they will lose their benefits package. If anyone does have a uh, disabled beneficiary, please speak to me personally afterwards and I will tell you a bit more about that. Care fees. Um, John and Mary don't have to use up their cash or sell their home should they go into care. They can let the local authority fund it. And if they wish, if they wanted to go into treetops or whatever, any additional expense can be topped up from their pots. Just a little wrinkle here, we, what we are finding, uh, what I'm finding, that local authorities are splitting up elderly couples, so John and Mary can continue, continue to live together without being ripped apart. So estate claims, uh, um, a very big worry, big worry nowadays, we're living in a very contentious, uh, very contentious society and uh, you know if you do, if you do have a uh, like a black sheep in the, in the family or whatever then that's going to be a great way of protecting those assets and making sure everybody is happy on that so let's look at the time life of, timeline of life now compared to the one before which i'll show you just like the first one we have the assets which are intact today but what mary and john have done now they put a trust in place right now they ring fence their assets with a wealth preservation trust and boy what difference does this make? And their life goes on, and they still suffer ill health, both go into care, but despite that, by the end of their lives, they still have a full asset base. Sure, the will, the will takes effect on death, but now there is a protected fund, and it go on to who they want. That is a trust, and it works beautifully. So everything I say to you to, today, this morning, any legal documents we, we prepare, we comply with a lot of stuff, trust laws, succession laws, things like that, the society will rise, is everything. The Crag Rules. Anybody heard of the Crag Rules? That's funny, it's, not, it's been a while since anybody, somebody has ever put their uh, hand up on that. Um, ooh, let's just go back one. The Crag Rules. The Crag Rules are charging for residential accommodation guidelines. They're absolutely crucial. These were the rules that were imposed on local authorities by the government. So you don't hear too much about them, but the government decided that they had to impose these rules uh, to stop local authorities doing their own little things that they want to do. For you who've gone online and looked up care fees generally, and I've done that, and uh, as a professional I was horrified by what you know I found online. There's so much misinformation, wrong information, so much dreadful advice online. <coughs> However, what I do encourage you to do is download the CRAG rules. So you can see exactly what the local authority has under their eyes. So let's just talk about the concept of deliberate deprivation. What is deliberate de deprivation? This is one of the subjects of the Crag rules look at. Deliberate deprivation is when you might say someone has deliberately got rid of their stuff so they don't have to pay care fees. As simple as that. I think the Crag rules are so good. This paragraph is one of my favourites. Let me read it out. Um, so yeah, um, the time of disposal should be taken into account when considering the purpose of the disposal. It would be unreasonable to decide that a resident has disposed of an asset in order to reduce his charge for accommodation when the disposable disposal took place at a time when he was fit and healthy and could not have foreseen the need for a move to residential accommodation. So I think the let me accompany that with a true life example. Um, I had a lovely lady contact us a few years ago. She was, she was 96. She said, I love the sound of your trust. Can I have one? So I went to see her. Obviously, got a, she got medical to see everything. She was sharp as a razor. Um, the, trust, uh, the trust, what happened was uh, she went into care. She, she, she um, set, the, set the trust up. And about a few months later, she went into care. Uh, she had to call actually. She went into care. It was about six months later. Um, now, the actual the local authority contacted me, and the reason for that she set it up was for for the delivery, not delivery, to avoid probate fees. Um, and the local authority didn't blink an eyelid. Um, there was no problem because 
that lady did not have, she did not foresee that she was going to have a fall, and she was not prone to falls, so it was within the guidelines. So, trust have been around since the Crusades, and now it's part of everyday life and used worldwide. Rich have been using them for over 900 years. Um, everyday people now use them, you know. Uh, most people use them now. Most things are, you know, are in a trust. Any yeah, hospitals, schools, pensions, charities, shops, probably this building, I don't know. I think there's a massive mis misconception out there that you have to be a Rothschild to own a castle to have a trust. In fact, I have a lot of people who, you know, the purchase of the local council property under the right to buy scheme, they, they, they have that property in trust to protect for their families. So, you know, trust use them. So what can I tell you about trust? They, they, they're individually tailored to your needs. Every family is different. They're indiv individually drafted by lawyers, lawyers of the site, we use society of real life. So you can't just pop into W.A. Smith and get them off the shelf. You can protect your home, your property, your savings, investments, all things like that. They last for 125 years, quite inter interesting. Interestingly, in 2010, the term was extended from 80 years to 125 years by politicians, and that's probably because they all have these. Um, well, this, this arrangement is not fandangled, it's not, or contentious, like, you know, David Cameron's offshore uh, holdings. It's perfectly mainstream planning. So you could put not just you, but your children, your grandchildren, and so on and so on, and Actually, at the end of the 20, 125 years, it can be renewed. So, we, what we do, I do, I believe given a complete suit of armour. Uh, I mean, if you are a com competent planner, estate planner, really, you, you must plan for the worst scenario, and that's what I do, you know, at Asset Wealth Preservation, make sure the bases are covered. So, what I do is give people a complete suit of armour. How do I do that? I simply say to them, if, if they work with me on a Wealth Preservation Trust, then I will entirely free prepare all the other documentations you need on that. Uh, believe me, to protect you against all these situations we just looked at, to include all of them. Just to recap the Wealth Preservation Trust and what it could do for you and your family. You're the boss of, you're the boss of your trust and you have con total control in your lifetime. You can place assets in easily. You can decide what you place in and what you protect. There's no tax issues. I said we tax and it's tax neutral. You're free to access your savings at any time. If you need to get, get it, you can get access to it. Uh, you, you're still free to raise cash on your home. If you go down that route to get equity release, it's fine. You can move home just like normal. No added expense at all or trouble. Uh, and you can downsize your house, and any cash that becomes available, this could remain in the trust, and so it's not up to the local authority funding. Uh, as long as you have mental capacity, you stay in control. If you do lose your mental capacity, then your designated trustees, they can take over for you, not the court of protection. On that, and it's fully reversible if you change your mind. Uh, you can appoint the loved ones to deal with your affairs if you become ill. As a side effect, as we talked about, of the Wealth Preservation Trust, it will protect your savings whilst you're alive, should you need care, and it also protect your home being sold or placed under any arrangement, should you need care. In fact, everything in the Wealth Preservation Trust is disregarded for care fees. So, why don't we know about trusts, more about this trust? This is something which I've always been asked at the end. Uh, why haven't been told this by all my trusted advisors? Well, I can only really speak as a state planner. Uh, I've been practicing for about 20 years. Trusts are not top of the agenda for solicitors banks for two reasons. Firstly, it's a very specialist area, and it's incredibly hard to be up to date with every single point of law. Um, secondly, most solicitors think, yes, I will do the will, but leave the trust or estate planning to the financial advisors, or even sometimes the accountants, things like that. So the other thing, of course, is that a solicitor doors, executory, and probate, you know, probate fees. They're a great part of a, of a practice income. If a lot of solicitors' clients had trusts, guess what? Um, they wouldn't have any much probate executory fees. Now, you know, bank, solicitors' banks can tell you there's the, their reason if they like or don't like trust, but don't be surprised that is the reality. So plan or not to plan it. It's an unusual person who goes through life and dies, even after the death hasn't paid at least one or two of these. 
normally probate fees, care fees quite often, sometimes deputyship uh, orders. The point I'm making here is the cost of the protection is minuscule to what you could pay. If you went into care for two weeks, you could have paid for all the protection that I've just talked about this evening. So, options. Um, obviously, you could choose to do nothing and run the gauntlet, but you could be one of those 1.1 million people and increasing who've lost their homes and savings at the moment and they haven't put planning in place. So, emergency last minute planning, sure, that's another option. There's other insurance companies out there. If you write them a check for £250,000, they will pay your care fees for the rest of your life. And so they should. Your family will still have to undertake probate, and most care homes you need to have a lasting powers of attorney in place before you become a resident. So that's still an expensive option. The third option, obviously, that's one I uh, advocate, it's a common sense one, is beware of these situations, see what can happen, plan against what, you know, what could happen. So, um, on that. So I've talked uh, this morning very broad principles. I hope you found something which I've said this this, e this morning useful, interesting, and informative. I'd like to think, you know, I'd like to think that you uh, say, Paul, well, let's continue this conversation. We want to delve into these uh, principles a bit much deeper. Certainly, you've touched upon something which we would like to talk more about. Otherwise, thank you very so much for your attention. It's been a, a good morning. You've been very patient with me. I do appreciate that. Any questions, please? Hello. Are the costs just for setting it up, or are they ongoing? Yes, a very good question. Uh, for setting it up, the cost of setting it up, and I'm talking about this all tonight, the, uh, the web presentation and all, all, everything, that uh, suit of armor, as I call it, that is um, about £1,600, including that, on that floor, but that's our <coughs> top, I'd say, you know, the, the best the person, is it? Pardon? The person. Um, no, that's for a couple actually. Oh. That's, uh, and that's with that. It's the only thing after that is a land registry cost, which is put your house into the put your house into the um, into the into into the trust. That's about eighty pounds. That's 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 it. Now ongoing. There's no actually ongoing cost. If you're if you um, if your family or your friends or trustees. Yeah, if this is your arrangement, it's just like your will, it's your arrangement. Um, but if they're the trustees, if you want them to be the trustees, then there's no cost. Now, if you didn't want them to be um, trustees, you wanted it like an independent corporation or a solicitor or something like that, um, because, for example, there might be some friction in the family, there might be something like that, and you need some independence there, then, um, yes, um, there would be a charge. Um, Whoever, whoever you consider. So, for example, if you um, um, if you did like a, a trust corporation or, or, or a, a, a solicitor, a local solicitor, they, they would charge. Something. It's normally about running the trust two hundred and fifty to three hundred pounds a year. Now, I use if people don't want to use their family, I use what's called the society will writers. They don't actually charge if there's no income producing assets in the trust. So. Um, so they don't have to do a tax return to see if there's no income producing because a house on its own, without you know, just uh, is, is not income producing unless it's a rental property. On <coughs> so, but to be honest, I've got families. Most I find that their families do uh, are trustees and they, they run it. Um, there's a few things to do, but it's worth the uh, hassle. But most of it, I find is that most people put their house in, which is their normally their biggest asset. Um, in that, and that's what they want to protect, and that's non income producing. So, with regards to the question, if I answered it, um, the charge is just this is for the toll is about 1600 ongoing. Well, not really, no. If you, you have your family doing it as the trustees, if you choose independent trustees um, elsewhere outside society will writers, that they will um, they charge, they have their hourly rates, etc., whatever they charge. And, the society will write will charge if it's about 150 years, if, if there is income producing assets, they have to do a tax return, it'd be about 150 pounds a year, something like that, as a, on that. Anybody else? Hello. If my husband and I both 
fees will be paid for by other taxpayers who may be less well off than we are. Is that moral? Um, well, <laughs> it's, it's a fair question. Uh, did everybody hear that? Um, but if I just repeat it, what it is is if, um, you know, basically, if I put it in a nutshell, we've paid tax and national insurances all, all, all our life. Um, should we pay for our care fees? Sorry. If my husband and I put all of our assets into a trust and then one of us or both of us end up in care, our fees would be paid by other taxpayers who may be less well off than we are. Is that moral? What you can do, I mean, you can choose to pay it yourself. Jeremy Corbyn, I think, has criticised the Prime Minister for receiving, I think, £100,000 of two gifts from his mother, saying this is to avoid his uh, inheritance tax on half his mother. He says these things are immoral. Do you agree? Um, I, I, I mean, I don't say they're immoral. No, as it, it, it's the law. I mean, the law, is, as it is, you, you play to what you've got in front of you. Uh, and, that's, I, I, and, and that's what he's done. I think it would be better and avoid all the immorality that goes on if the government reduced inheritance tax to, say, 10 or 5%. Then they do away. Yes, yeah. 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 yes there's, there's a lot of options, isn't there? It's very political, obviously. Um, but the, you know, the questions are. It's, there's a lot of moral questions here for you, and then you know, it's been some people feel that I've got war veterans; they don't feel that they should pay them if they're going to jail. Um, you know, some people think yes, I, I, I'm going to pay. So. I'm, I'm, um, perhaps that's more suitable for the Catholic Society topical discussion than really. uh, Any more particular questions? Do I then say just thank you to Paul for the fascinating story of that John and Mary was say signing with the arches of the people. I have to say though that please note that the UCA can't endorse any particular company. Uh, because people come here, so you must make your own decisions uh, about that. But we heartily thank you for all this useful, interesting information and personalising it like that it makes it simple for us to understand. Can we give them a good night?